The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O oh God, our defender, storms rage around and within us and cause us to be afraid. Rescue your people from despair. Deliver your sons and daughters from fear. And preserve us in the faith of your Son. Amen. You may we will be having our children's object lesson. We won't have you come up front. But afterwards, the children are invited to go to Children's Church, which is right outside on the front steps. And so um, I just wanted to say, uh, I will, oh, I've got something here I want to show you as well. But I wanted to say that this is a time when many people are getting ready to go back to school, right? Quite a few of you here, I think, are getting ready to go back to school. And I want to say that I'm also, in a sense, going back to school. I was going to take some seminars. Well, as these things go, they got turned into webinars. So that's what I've started doing this past week. And in my first one, I learned a new word, and it's up on the screen. Has anybody ever seen that word before? I hadn't either. I didn't even know how to pronounce it. So I learned how to pronounce it. I'll say it, I'll ask you to say it, and then we'll talk about what it means. Liminality. Liminality. What does it mean? Anybody have an idea? I hear a lot of ideas from behind mass, and I don't understand. I apologize. I'll just tell you. First of all, limen is an old Latin word that means what this is, which I bought from Lowe's, it looks like a piece of wood, but if you look at it more carefully, it is a threshold. A lemon is a threshold. And in case you didn't know, a threshold is what is at the bottom of a door, and it marks the space between indoors and outdoors, or between two rooms within a building. It has a very useful function. And liminality, then, is a place where there is a threshold, a change, going from one place to another. And it kind of describes those in-between moments. We're betwixt and between. And we all have them, and they're necessary, but they're not always fun, are they? when we're in between. So what I want to do is put this threshold down here, and I'm going to use it for the children's sermon. I'm not going to attach it firmly to the floor. I just use duct tape, so don't worry about that. And then to say that this illustrates some of what we'll be learning about today in the message, about these in-between times, these transition times. So to help me, Lewis and I put the Living Lord menagerie into a wagon, and this illustrates that we are together on a journey. And so we've got the lion, Elfie the pink elephant, and a monkey, all the stuffed animals that we've had around here. And so that wagon is on a journey, just like so many of us are, and it needs to go from one room to the next, or from indoors to outdoors, or however you see it. And so, let me ask you something. What is the best way to go over a threshold? Carefully. <laughs> because if you go too fast, you might lose everything. Your wagon will be bumpy, okay? And so I'm going to ask Lewis then to take this wagon load of people carefully over the threshold. Let's see if he can do it without losing the monkey or something. There's kind of a bump there, isn't it? It's a little harder. Okay, got over one, but there's still, you can't stop now. You got to get over the other one. He made it. Bravo. Okay. 
you get an A for the day, you can go home now. How's that sound? Okay. <laughs> and I want to note that besides the fact that when we go through a transition, that we need to be careful. The other thing is this, is that we know that Christ is on this side of the threshold, and we know that Christ is on this side of the threshold. Isn't that amazing how Jesus can be two places at once? And so the other thing that as we're going through a transition is we're in a liminal moment, a threshold moment, is that we realize Christ is with us throughout the journey. And so we can trust Christ, and because of that, we can act carefully and make sure that everyone stays on board. So that is a lesson to be thinking about. And children, you can now go out to Children's Church. Our lesson today is from Paul's letter to the Philippians. And you may remember that we have been studying this from the time of Lent. Many of you have completed your studies, but I have also been having our staff read some of the passages that have been very meaningful to us. And so this is one of those passages, and they selected some passages that were particularly meaningful or their favorites. As you hear it, pick your own favorites, the passage that might be very meaningful to you. It's from Paul's letter to the Philippians, the fourth chapter. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have received, revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but I had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is our first lesson from Scripture. Please stand now as we prepare to hear Jesus' words. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side of the Sea of Galilee while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. 
But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You have little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Today I'd like to talk more about this being on a journey and ask in particular the question that kind of is related to the children's sermon about when your wagon is bumpy, but related to Jesus' gospel story today and just ask, what happens when your boat is rocking? Well, the big reality is is that we're all on a journey all the time. We don't always admit it, we don't always like it, but we are on a journey. And so Jesus' disciples today are going on a journey, and this is a good reminder for us. I will be going on a journey in a month. I will be 200 miles north of here at my next congregation. You are going on a journey, and you are in one of those threshold moments right now in which you are preparing to meet the candidate who is going to be your senior pastor this evening and to read about him in the news that you will receive in the mail, and then next weekend to vote on that senior pastor candidate as well. You're on a journey, I'm on a journey, we're all on a journey together with Jesus. This is what Christians do. So the disciples today were on a boat, and in the early years of the church, I don't know if you know this or not, But the image that was often used in art for the church was a boat or a ship or Noah's Ark in which God led all of or carried all of God's creatures to safety. And there is a visual reminder of that in our architecture. And you may not even know this, but this room, which is often called a sanctuary, has another name, an ancient name. This room is sometimes called a nave. How do you remember that? Look straight up. And you see that the peak of the roof resembles, if it were upside down, the keel of the hull on a ship. And so that is why the word nave and the word navy are actually related because they both have to do with being on a journey in a ship, being led through the waters as well. So every time I enter this, I imagine that we are on a ship, we are on a journey, and the key phrase that I want you to remember this week is this, that when Jesus takes you on a journey... He will be with you to the very end. Remember that. When Jesus takes you on a journey, he will, he will be with you to the very end. And this is so important to know when the boat is rocking and we're tempted to doubt and to be afraid. There will be those times. Storms and winds and rain and waves. And so... When the disciples were crossing the Sea of Galilee and all those things came up, they were afraid. And Peter tries to be courageous and he tries to have faith and he walks toward Jesus until his fears carry him down into the water. They overwhelm him and sink him. Ever felt that way? I have. And I would be dishonest to believe otherwise. It reminds me of the fact that this morning when I woke up, I heard about the rains last night and some of the flash floods 
that are in our own community and county. Or a week ago, I was out doing some of my visiting in the area on my day off, and I was down in Herman, Missouri, and it had rained for several days straight, and it had rained that day, and the water started coming up over the bridge, and I had to take an alternate route. I was safe, but it reminds me of the storms that can batter us. Well, I'd like to share a couple of photos from my home region, that area along the Mississippi between Minnesota and Wisconsin. And 13 years ago, in this very month, there was a terrible local flood in that area. And this town, Rushford, Minnesota, was flooded, as were many others in the area. And it was a very difficult and sad thing, and yet, looking at the next slide, you can see that people pulled together and made relief that helped others and caused people to feel strong and courageous. And so this is the message that they ended up showing to the world. Never, ever give up. And in a way, that reminds us of what Jesus is saying here today. Now, I have to say, in that rain, my own home was flooded. And we live up on a hill. How did that happen? There was 17 and a half inches of rain in 24-hour period. So our home got flooded, and I said, Mary, we better get an ark, because if we're flooded, we're all going to need to be taken to safety. Now, there may be times, I don't want to speak for you, but you just decide for yourself. There may be times during this past year, in 2020, when you felt like we or you have been in a flood okay, or a storm. And I just want to highlight that I love working with the people that are here on staff and volunteers and council. And the three that I work with probably the most closely are Jen LeClaire, the president, Deborah schrader Sonnier, the vice president, and our own dear Lewis, my ministry associate. And so I have wondered if in the last year and a half, life sometimes felt like this, drinking from a fire hose. I think we'll need to give them that uh, award, the fire hose award, okay? And, you know, I don't know if many knew that a year and a half ago, for example, both pastors would be leaving. And then as Lewis mentioned in a sermon a couple of weeks ago, if you had told me a year and a half ago that I would be married, living in the Midwest, expecting a baby in a pandemic, I would have never believed you, but I wouldn't have had it any other way. The next slide shows what it may feel like. God says, I have a plan for your life, and this is what it feels like. The Holy Spirit's hanging on tight, and... We're terrified. So what do you do when your boat is rocking? Remember, when Jesus takes you on a journey, he will go with you to the very end. The point is, is that there actually is an end, or at least a series of destinations. We are going somewhere. And I'm not just talking about heaven and eternity with Christ, but even in this life as well. We're not drifting aimlessly. We have a destination, a purpose, and a goal. Now, we may not realize it from this little story in the gospel lesson today, but actually those disciples were on what we might call a mission trip. Remember last week that Jesus fed 5,000 people and that if you look ahead, you will see that when they land on the other shore, on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, that people are swarming around him, clamoring to touch him and to be touched and to be healed of their many illnesses. And so 
This is a mission trip that is necessary for them to get from one side to the other to the people that are there. And that is the key thing to remember, is that both sides needed what Jesus had to give. And if we look around us right now, there are people on all sides of us who need what Jesus still offers, who need that word of love from God, who need to be fed physically or spiritually, who need the healing touch of Christ in their body, mind, or spirit. This reminds us that we are never, ever alone. We just have to look at the destination that Christ has put in front of us. We have to remember that we are part of something and a purpose that is bigger than ourselves. And as that sign in Rushford, Minnesota said, never, ever give up. We are on a mission. We have a destination, a goal, a purpose. And our mission comes from the very heart of God for this broken world. As at the time of the disciples, people still needed to hear this, to be fed, to be healed. Now, a couple months ago, I gave you all what I call kind of a trick question. And it was a complete the sentence, fill in the blank. And the sentence starts out this way. God's church has a mission is what many of you said, and I couldn't agree more. But I want to turn that on its side just a little bit and rearrange it and have a new fill in the blank or complete the sentence. God's mission has a church. Exactly. See, the journey, the mission, the purpose is the point. And we've been caught up in the boat with Christ. We're not just drifting aimlessly. We have got the wind of the Holy Spirit filling our sails. It doesn't depend on any one individual. It doesn't depend on me. It doesn't depend on pastors, whether past or future pastors. It depends on Christ who has put us in mission, who has put our boat into the water, and travels with us along the way. Now, earlier I said that we've been studying Philippians and having this as the basis for our staff devotions on Monday morning. And from this particular passage, did you pick a favorite from, for yourself? Let me tell you the one that most of us mentioned, and that was this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Think about that. Each time when the waves hit, when the storms come up, we can face those things together with the help of God. We can grow stronger and more resilient. Think about it. The wind does not have to be our enemy. The wind can propel us by the power of the Holy Spirit to go faster. So it's with Christ as our captain. It is full speed ahead. I'm going to repeat that because it's very important. With Christ as our captain, it is full speed ahead. We gather together on site or online. We are recharged and then Christ sends us on a journey, sends us on a mission. We trust that God who put the boat into the water will stay with us as we travel to the other side. So, again, this phrase that I want you to remember, finish it with me. When Christ takes you on a journey, he will be with you to the very end. Amen? Now, I promised that I would tell you a little bit about the song that we will be having the choir lead us. They will be singing, but I want you to stand and join us. And it was written by a man named Horatio Spafford in 1873. Might seem like a long time ago, but he had several years of disappointments and tragedies. He lost his son 
to death, an early death. He lost much of his business in the great Chicago fire. And then he was going to send his family on a trip and join them in Europe. And on the way, the ship that they were sailing or, or riding in was colliding with another one. And it capsized, and his four daughters drowned. And yet, despite this, he had the faith and the courage to never, ever give up. And so he wrote this song, When peace like a river, it is well with my soul. So please stand that and stand up and let us sing that together. <laughs> 